Well, thank you very much for coming here. I was the first Jewish Secretary of State, and of course, I had a life as a member of a Jewish family that went through the Holocaust. So these were not experiences that one could separate from one's actions. And uh, it's, these are experiences, of course, of which uh, I remain conscious. I thought the best way to conduct this discussion is for you to ask questions uh, that concern you. I will give the best answers based on my recollections today. So I do not know every detail, but as you all know, it was a searing experience. And so many events, maybe most events, one remembers almost on a daily basis. So if I can help you reconstruct events, I'll do so to the best of my ability. But feel free, if you have a contrary view to anything I say, to state it. So who wants to start? Well, um, we'll start with just a few remarks about the purpose of this interview for the record, you know, uh, because it is record. That, uh, well, we all know that the Yom Kippur War is the most traumatic event in Israeli history. It is a very important event in the history of the Middle East and to a certain extent also the world um, uh, in general. Um, and it is really a great opportunity for us to receive your views, not the details, your views, your perspectives about the main events before the war, during the war, and after the war, what we can learn from, from this war. So our questions will relate to these three periods, of course. And uh, again, we uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing your experience and uh, recollection with us. Uh, Professor Kissinger, maybe we should, at the beginning, just go over some of the main events. And again, following uh, this uh, structure of before, during, and after. And we would like to start with the time before the war. And let's define it uh, to make it easier, 69 to 73, or the, the ongoing discussions that you led in order to try and find a solution to the Israeli-Arab conflict. Uh, there were many of them. And I would like to ask about your meetings with Hafez Ismail, about the secret channel with Anwar Sadat. What sort of chance, how did you view that in real time, and what sort of chance did you give that that it would really go, uh, lead to reconciliation in the, middle, in the Middle East? The, first of all, when you talk about the history of of that period. It didn't necessarily, for the American side, segment itself into the same parts as for you. In its first term, uh, Nixon did not want the peace negotiations moved into the White House. He put them under the direction of the Secretary of State. And he more or less kept them there until the beginning of his second term, which is when the contact with Hafez 
İsmail. İsmail okuyor. Uh, the White House as an institution had no negotiations with with Arab leaders. They were mostly, almost exclusively conducted by the State Department on on the various uh, peace initiatives. Of course, the White House had to approve them and expressed views as they were being developed, but the negotiations were essentially conducted uh, in terms of some of these ideas of a Suez Canal arrangement. When I got in touch with, uh, it, no, it's really the other way around, they got in touch with us and I indicated a willingness to receive them, of course fully discussed with Nixon. Uh, our idea at the time was, this was early in 73, I believe. Our idea at the time was we would begin a dialogue, but we did not think it could really be effective until after the Israeli election, which was supposed to be at the end of that year. But we intended to do the preparatory work on the key issues, or on some of the key issues, and also to find out what the Egyptians had on their mind. So I saw, I saw him twice, once in America and another time in in France, near Paris. Um, what what impression did you come up with from your first meeting with him, which was the main meeting with Hafiz Ismail? Did you see enough meat to bite in order to start moving a political process, or uh, was it uh, too thin? My main, main concern at that point was not to start a negotiation, but to find, to, to make clear to them how we visualized a, a process. And uh, how we visualized a solution short of an all-out solution that separated the problem into various parts. As I remember, he was only interested in an overall solution, which would have to be imposed on the on Israel. And so we just talked about the components but we, well, they have. They said afterwards it was clear to them that we were not going to to move on this. And when you delivered that offer or conditions or uh, preterms to Golda Meir and other Israelis, how were you? How was you impressed? How were you impressed with their comments and their reaction? The Israelis. The Israelis. Uh, I did not do that. I did not do it. I was at those conversations were for my assessment to be made to Nixon. Once we moved into the actual operation, I would be charged with dealing also with Golda. Uh, I don't think Nixon was eager to 
do that at this point. Mm -hmm. So I was not involved in actual negotiations with Arabs and not uh, negotiate not not involved in any governmental negotiations with Israeli. I, the, I knew many of the leaders and I knew their views as the various plans developed, but I was not the principal that they were focused on. But uh, Golda comes to Washington immediately after your first round of talks with Hafez Ismail and you it, it is on the table um, and in general, not specifically about these this talks, what, what was your impression of Golda's readiness to give, actually to give Sadat what he wants, which is the Sinai, with security arrangements, etc. Did you see any development in her attitude toward reaching an agreement, or she stayed all the time in the same place? It's first of all not the way we worked. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's the wrong way to put it. I mean, we did not come to Golda and said, here is our precise idea. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, as I remember it, it's a long time ago, the basic agreement was that from now on the negotiations would be moved into the White House. Yes. And uh, there was that Israel was not willing to go back to the 47 borders and that this was unachievable. At that moment, was a rather settled idea mm -hmm. in our mind. Did you, did you felt in real time that if an arrangement is not reached now, following some things that Hafez Ismail and maybe other Egyptian officials uh, told you, there will be war? Was there a viable threat that, the, that Egypt, what cannot be achieved, with negotiation would try to achieve by force? We in the White House were not, we, the, there was a difference of opinion which was, which was sort of a global opinion, which was that there was only one way to make peace and this was with an overall peace agreement mm -hmm. immediately or that was not our view. Our view was that this was probably not achievable and that therefore we would prefer to move step by step. As we repeatedly made clear, mm -hmm. that was not a secret. And uh, as we said to the Egyptians. In the balance between getting Egypt out of the Soviet camp and uh, promoting uh, the beginning of a peace process between Egypt and Israel. Uh, how did you balance these two goals? Uh, uh, did they complement each other or um, did you see any contradictions? We didn't look at things that way. Uh, we had a strategic concept mm -hmm. and I said in the first months of the Nixon administration, I said to some press person, an unwise comment, our plan is to expel the Soviet Union from Egypt. Mm -hmm. That was part of our overall concept. That was the guiding concept in dealing with the Soviet Union, and in a way with Egypt. We had a sort of a phrase which we sent to practically every Arab state when the 73 war broke. 
which is you can make war with Soviet arms, but to make peace you need American diplomacy. And please keep that in mind. That's what we were work, working on before the war. So all these fine points of negotiation and of, of that was not the Nixon style mm -hmm. or my style. We wound up there, but first we wanted to get it across that that was going to be our approach. Dr. Kisser, sorry for playing the, I know the, the game that uh, historians do not like to play, counterfactual history. The Yom Kippur War, the October 1970 war, is uh, the big trauma in the history of our nation. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people are saying, in retrospect, this is a war that could have been saved if Israel would react differently to the Egyptian proposals sent by Professor Kissinger. Do you agree with this claim? Of course not. Uh, First of all, there was no specific proposal to agree to. What there was was an idea of what the outcome should be. Uh, what would have happened if Israel had come to us and said they want the 47 border and they would like us to advocate the 47 border? That never happened and in my opinion couldn't have happened in the circumstance of the time. It couldn't have happened under Sata, under Asa, under NASA. And now in retrospect one can draw great conclusions about Sadat. But it took a while before people realize the extent to which he was willing to go. So I don't believe the war could have been avoided except by Israeli acceptance of the Arab peace plan. Mm -hmm. And that didn't really exist. Yes. Um, you mentioned that uh, your strategy was to start, prepare the ground for a bigger initiative after the Israeli elections. Uh, what was the concept of this initiative? Well, you first of all have to, have to understand uh, that in the first Nixon administration, we were preoccupied with the Vietnam War. We had the opening to China. We had the they talked with, with the Soviet Union. We had the uh, East uh, Pakistan uh, uprising. So it's not that we were unemployed. Oh, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and, and these were, and those were priorities. They had to be dealt with. It wasn't that we said Israel is less important. We said we cannot possibly get to this. In addition, it was our judgment that the overall plan would not either be accepted by Israel. I personally never approved of, of the concept, so I and so far as my opinion mattered, it was known. But Nixon made the final decisions. But this was not an item that had the same priority. Even in, uh, in, in uh, late 1973? Well, of course, he had other troubles. By 1973, we were in the final stages of the Vietnam War. We were at, at the beginning of the trip to China. 
the trip to China actually only took place in February 1973. The trip to Moscow when took place in uh, May 1973. So the question you are putting is if we had done something in May, between May and, 70, uh, and September 1973, could the war have been avoided? Uh, I, we obviously didn't think so, or we would have done it. Yes. And when getting close to the war, you're getting more and more signs The tension is in the uh, build-up. Gromyko comes to Washington and says, we will wake up one day with war. You get reports from uh, your intelligence that there are possible plans for war. And you are beginning to worry that maybe war is imminent. But it's also true that in the weeks before we asked Israel regularly, what are the are there any signs of war? Uh, in fact, when I on my first weekend as Secretary of State, I went to the State Department to look at their intelligence reports because they had not been circulated to me in that form when I was security advisor. And I asked the Israelis to give me an assessment of the deployments every other day for a two-week period. So, but had we gotten it, we would certainly have made diplomatic moves, but uh, there was no possibility, at least with the limits on our intelligence. I mind, by, by, that I mean my our IQs mm -hmm. to say now in the summer of '73 we have to come up with an overall peace plan. Um, we thought the opposite would be a good, we wanted to get a more detailed expression of Israel and above all from, from Egypt. When the war broke out, we had not yet come to any definitive conclusion about Sadat. We know that uh, when war broke out, there were two surprises actually. One, that the war started without any early warning, and the other, the, the Israeli defeats in the battlefield in the first few, few days of the, the, the war. And I'm, I read quite a lot about uh, the administration, or radio memoirs, of course, and uh, other accounts, and the impression is that it took the administration time to understand that the expectations between before the what war, it, which, after the war broke out. Yes, after the war broke out, to realize that Israel's situation is really uh, far worse than uh, what anyone could yeah, have expected. Yeah, but it took Israel a little time. <laughs> it took Israel also. <laughs> yeah. On, well, you know that our Minister of Defense Moshe Dayan, he spoke on the second day of the war. Uh, in terms of uh, war on of the third temple and uh, thing like that, he he in fact uh, went to the other extreme. Um, but uh, um, how were uh, uh, the Israeli uh, reports about the war the main source of information for you to to estimate the situation, or, or did you have your own? Uh, uh, sources, especially intelligence sources. Well, you, if if you people were engaged in war activities personally, you know that it never 
moves in such a clear line that there is a flood of information that comes in out of which you have to sort what you make on the basis of which you make your decision. And you have to break it down into categories. In the first days of the war, a primary objective was to get an understanding of the situation and at a minimum stabilize it. So uh, there was no time for great thinking at that point. Uh, and that's what we did. And uh, we received a lot of wrong reports, including some that Israel had started the war. Yes. And uh, we took the position from the beginning that uh, Israel territory should be inviolate. And the, from the beginning, we're working on a UN resolution, mm -hmm. which would express that. Uh, and uh, so the political objectives of the various parties only crystallized uh, as the situation evolved, including the Israeli thing. When, uh, well, just before the war, how, and in, in any general, how much importance did you attribute to the, to make sure that the Israelis are not the first one to open fire, like in the Six Day War? On the national level, on my level, um, we thought that was understood. And I don't think we made a, spe a specific request. But on the working level, I don't doubt that that thought was often expressed. Meaning the U.S. asked Israel, please do not launch a preemptive I strike. It ever, I don't think it ever got to that point. If, if I may, uh, in 1968, in early 1968, before the Nixon administration enters into office, the Israeli chief of staff speaks already in terms of we will not be able to be to shoot the first shot in the next war. So it was an understanding in Israel, even without American uh, pressures or, or anything. But that you know, this is it the didn't situation. come up. If we are realistic, it didn't come up that way. No. In of terms not. of a decision, you were surprised. Yes. You didn't expect it. Uh, you were never in a position to ask us whether you could do a meaningful first strike. Uh, but you could say yes. Maybe in the last hours, yes. you couldn't have organized a meaningful strike. And, and or maybe you could have. It never came to us. Yeah, when, when it came to you, it was after the Israeli decision was made already not to, to strike the first strike. So, uh, they um, were not. There were stories and rumors and some interviews uh, upon which, according to which, United States has seen Israeli preparation to launch a nuclear strike, or at least taking the surface-to-surface -surface long range missiles from the silos and preparing them and do that for your satellites and the Russian satellites to see and understand that Israel uh, grasps the situation as severe. What was the influence of that move from Israel on, on you? Uh. I don't think that's correct. That information, if it existed, never came to me. And we never acted on, on it one way or the other. So the, the story is as if Simcha Dinitz has said something in a meeting but with Simcha you. Simcha Dinitz wasn't even in America at the time. He was in Israel. Yeah. But, yeah. And... Uh, there was no 
senior Israeli there whose words would have had the weight of such a threat. But that's not what... Uh, it could be that such information was around. It'd be amazing if it were not brought to me. And at that moment, Nixon was in Florida and operationally, I was conducting business on that day. Uh, yeah. I refer to that meeting that you had with, with Dinitz. The transcript says that you were left alone for, for, for just between you and there's no... But there was the third day of the but war. Then, or maybe the third day of the war. Yeah, when he came and part of the meeting is not transcribed. That's possible. That happened occasionally. Uh, that's probably true. Uh, I cannot, there was not a conversation in which Israel threatened the use of nuclear weapons. And it would have been unwise to do because the possession of nuclear weapons was not recognized formally. But uh, was it a consideration even, was it, it a consideration in the administration that Israel might be pushed to a very, uh, to a corner where uh, it will have no other choice but to threaten, not use, but threaten? Did you, was it? didn't it affect any decision okay. that was made. Uh, you took a chaotic situation at the beginning of the war. A what? A chaotic, uh, a mess, a uh, surprising situation. And I don't know how you managed to do it, but you came up with uh, an outcome that allowed the beginning of the most promising diplomatic process between Israel and Egypt, and later Israel and Syria. Can you elaborate a little bit about what went through your mind when you did it? Because it, it, in a way it is a miracle. Um, how did you do it? Well, first we didn't improvise it when the war started. Uh, we, in our internal discussions, which meant in effect Nixon and myself, with a f few others occasionally, we had decided, we had always wanted or planned that if a war broke out, that the two ways a negotiation could come about. One through American pressure in an American initiative, and the other with American pressure as a result of a war. And uh, we had intended to do it at the beginning of 74 and of 73, and to start building up to it in 73. Uh, and then when the war broke out, remember these deadlines are very short. It was really breaking out at the moment that we had planned for the peace offensive anyway. Uh, what we didn't know was that there would be a partner that was willing to do a peace step-by-step -step approach. So that enabled us to move much faster than one could have anticipated. And with more Israeli cooperation. And it needed the war to create more Israeli cooperation. I don't, I don't say that necessarily. We had had many conversations with Rabin and Dayan and as friends. Uh, they, they didn't have to be forced to do this. 
not, not forced, I'm just saying that the, maybe the, the, the existence, the trauma of the war. But I wanted to ask Dr. Kishin about the airlift that a lot of people in Israel thank you for uh, making and establishing. How was it, how hard was it to convince President Nixon to go for the airlift? To, what, what do you mean by that? To, uh, to order U.S. military forces to support Israel with the military airlift that will help Israel uh, regroup and re reinforce. Well, that didn't come up in that manner. That came up in the form of Israeli requests for military equipment, which started on the first day, yes. and which we in the White House supported starting the first day. At that time to be picked up, the equipment to be picked up by Israeli commercial planes that were adapted to this. That started Sunday evening. And uh, was approved by the White House. It was carried out reluctantly by some others. So that was the first phase of the resupply. The next phase started when the Israelis informed us that of the losses in the Sinai battle. Up to that point, we thought the battle was moving in favor of, of Israel and that the next news would be an Arab collapse. And uh, so that news was brought to us uh, by Dennett, who had flown back on a Tuesday morning. And uh, that was the day that Nixon had to arrange the uh, resignation of his vice president. So he was not personally av available. So I told Dennett, uh, we would answer him by that evening. And we told him that evening that rather than uh, talk now about specific supplies, we promised to replace all equipment that was lost in the war and so that therefore Israel could conduct its operations without having to keep a reserve for post-war contingencies. So that's what we promised them that night. And then the next day started the question how to deliver this equipment. With, with the military did not want to use American military airlift. They wanted to mobilize the civilian reserve fleet. And one had to clear airports in the Azores. So that debate went on. But while that debate was going on, there was a number of airplanes and other equipment that was already being delivered every day. I think three F-4s were delivered every day mm -hmm. and which was fairly close to what was available anyway. Uh, and then Friday night when the issue had not yet been settled, Nixon ordered the civilian, the whole military air fleet, which had never been done. Uh, but it never was when you say 
was there a debate as these requests came in uh, well these requests were objected to but there was never a formal confrontation but the the part of the debate was whether to use American military aircraft or or, or not and I understand the the the uh, that you wanted to get out of the war as an honest broker, uh, providing Israel with American airlift uh, might cast some doubts in the Arab world about whether the United States can be an honest broker, and at the well, same time, when no, the war... No, but you look at this. From what happened, there was an increasing level of American supply, supply day by day. There was never a stoppage of American supply for consideration at any point. It's while increased quantities were being discussed that there was some debate. But uh, I bet if you analyzed how many shipments were actually held up, uh, there wouldn't be many, any. I would say there would be none. Dr. Kissinger, you started with saying saying something about your origin, connection to the, to the Holocaust. Was there a moment during these days, first week, or first 10 days, were you afraid that Israel will not prevail, will not win, that you as, as a Jew was concerned? Yes. It, I didn't think Israel would collapse militarily, but I thought that Israel might get itself into a position where it gets pushed into an endless series of retreats that I thought might happen. And it could have been a moment of panic in the early days, but that I didn't take as decisive. And this is why I think initially you recommended Israel not to take the Egyptian proposal for a full retreat to the 47 line in return for a ceasefire. Well, when the, but not during the war. I think there was, there was one, one uh, request coming through the channel from Hafez Ismail basically saying if Israel retreat we will go for a ceasefire. I, that you can take out of these floods of papers the ceasefire we were supporting was an Israeli a, a Dayan a, propo, a Dayan a originated proposal on about the third or fourth day of the war and said that wouldn't hear of it. Mm -hmm. We tried to get a UN resolution started for that. Um, yeah, there was, uh, at a certain stage, Israel agreed to uh, a ceasefire in place. Uh, it was towards the 11th or the 12th of October. Um, but then... It was on, I, I don't know the date, I know the day. Yeah. It was around Thursday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't in favor of it, actually, but we supported it. Yes, uh, it was a dramatic uh, moment in Israel because uh, Israel almost agreed to a ceasefire and then came a, an intelligence message that the Egyptians are going to renew the uh, offensive in the Sinai and this is what we wanted them to do. So Israel decided not to go for a ceasefire. And on the 14th, uh, that is on Sunday, I think, uh, was the great but second battle in, in the Sinai where yep. this turned the tide in, in, in the war. I, I, I'm interested personally a lot in, in intelligence, and I wonder what do you think about the support that you received from the American intelligence community during this major crisis? 
there were people in the intelligent community that had a different assessment from Israeli assessment. But I don't consider that a question of support or not support. Because when I look at the Israeli decision-making process before the war and during the war, intelligence plays a huge part. I mean, it is very, very important. Um, in the American system, I see that the intelligence is not so crucial. Uh, is it because the quality of the intelligence is not good enough or, or just because uh, you don't need it so much? Well, we got the daily Israeli intelligence mm -hmm. from the Israelis. We got daily reports from our people. We took it seriously, but there's only so much time you can spend mm -hmm. on, uh, on, intelligence. on intelligence reports. Mm -hmm. But we had daily meetings where these in fact, there were twice daily meetings. We had the so-called Washington Special Action Group. Mm -hmm. And that's where we did most tactical discussions. And that's where it was used for information. Because in but Nixon and I thought we were very well informed. Mm -hmm. In retrospect, how do you see the Soviet behavior during the, the war, and how did that play in favor or against your goal to expel them from, from Egypt? My impression of the Soviets was that on the, at the beginning of the war, they felt an obligation to support the, the war. But it ran counter to what they would have preferred to be doing with the Americans. So they didn't want to lose the American relationship. So I think what happened was that they compromised. They supported their allies, but they never could muster a full a full-scale support, and that's true at the beginning of crisis and during the conduct of crisis. And were you afraid at any moment that this could deteriorate to some sort of confrontation? Or yes, of yes. course. What was that point? Well, we thought of it, of course, uh, the night we went on alert. That's when we thought, at the very beginning of the war, we thought, we thought there was a theoretical chance of confrontation, so we stayed in touch with the Soviets by letting them know the nature of our commitment. But the, the real moment occurred during the uh, during the alert. That they might be lo or mobilizing uh, nuclear warheads? Well, I was concerned then. I was concerned now about Soviet nuclear capability in these situations and the dilemma of uh, nuclear deterrence is uh, that you must produce a credible warning but avoid that it triggers a preemptive attack. You have to have that always in mind and you have to prepare yourself because you can't invent it every time it arises anew. But, but, so, the whole period we were 
threatening and offering. When you raised your nuclear alert on the 24th uh, of October, um, it was, of course, because of Brezhnev's note that uh, we want uh, to send uh, our forces together with you, but if you don't if you don't want, we can do it, uh, we'll have to do it by ourselves or unilaterally. And there was a high state of alert of the Soviet airborne divisions, but uh, there were also... They, they were all alert. Yes, yes. And, but the, there were also reports about Soviet uh, warheads that began, uh, uh, nuclear warheads that gone through the Bosphorus to Egypt. That's correct. It, the reports were there. Uh, as far as we know today, they didn't do it. No, it we knew them. Sorry? We knew these reports. And uh, uh, was this on the table when you decided to raise the state of alert? The nuclear It wars. was in my mind. No. Uh, we d I think yes. But we, we didn't do it that way. Uh, Our decisions weren't sort of a pedantic uh, going through individual items. The group that met then was involved in all the decisions. If I think we are getting to the end of the war and the outcome of the of the war. You're also getting to the end of the Yes. <laughs> we, are good we are trying to be precise with that. So, uh, Dr. Kissinger, I'm sorry for being benign. Who do you think won the October 73 war? I think the irony may be that nobody wants it. We certainly didn't want it. Israel didn't want it. Egypt wanted it just enough to get a diplomacy started. That's what they wanted. R Russia, mm -hmm. Yes, they started it. So they wanted a war because they thought that was the best way, the only way to get diplomacy started. I think they were wrong. I think we would have started the uh, sort of diplomacy that led to the disengagement agreements. That was our plan. But what I don't know is whether Egypt could have afforded to make such a settlement absent a military action. Regaining their pride. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe you won, because at the end of the day, your strategy of expelling the Soviet from uh, Egypt prevailed. You won and we all won because we didn't have any more wars with Egypt, you know. This is the big, the big things. Um, uh, I think of it as a generally successful diplomacy. Looking now to the future. And, you know, the situation in the Middle East. And from your vantage point, uh, what do you think in the long run will best serve or can ensure Israel security? Truth. Israel security, Israel security today. To, from I can't do that at the end of an interview. We can start all over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, but maybe just... I mean, that's a key question. No. Are we going the right way? It's a very, it's a very fluid situation in which it's possible that some things that look very favorable in 
one fades, become less favorable or maybe even disadvantageous later, which doesn't make them wrong. It just means you have to watch them as you go through them. It's a very complicated period that's ahead because policies that may be necessary for one limited period could become dangerous if they're pursued too long. Yes. Maybe I'll rephrase the last question and ask, you, you said something about Russia today, if I understand correctly, or Russia in relation to, are we, f are we in the middle of, you, you were managing the Cold War, you ended part of it, are, you, are we in the middle of a new Cold War? In almost all the crises around the world, there is a temptation for a Cold War, because it looks simple to them in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And because it ended well. And so you see it with Russia, you see it with China. And uh, you see it all over the Middle East, of course. That is a very dangerous evolution. Uh, so f one final question, <laughs> which relates to your academic background as well. Well, I assume in the midst of a transformation of the world order. Um, in the past, such transformations always involved major wars, hegemonic wars. Do you think that we are going to face a new war? This is going to be the big debate. I think with modern technology, uh, that has to be avoided. And that has to be the absolute acme of statesmanship to avoid. Because you once you started with weapons whose extent you can't control because they partly control themselves and for which you have no military experience. You must now manage it without war. That's never been done. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Well, I so much. Thank you very much.